So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming on the last day at 8 o'clock in the morning. Really appreciate you being here. I'm very excited for our conversation today. As you know, the title of our session is The Role of Education Work Research in uh, the Era of Fake News. We know that in recent times, we have witnessed challenges by federal, state, and local elected officials to the fundamental principles and values of higher education in the United States as well as in other countries. Particularly troubling are the disregard and politicization of facts, data, and research, as well as science. Also worrisome are mischaracterizations and meaning of the importance of academic freedom. So in this session, we have a couple of goals. One is to advance productive and interactive dialogue about how we, as individuals and as a collective, can ensure the integrity of knowledge. And I think it's important for us to think about what we're doing now and how we might plan to respond more effectively in the future as well. We also want to think about what the role of our collective is in terms of the role of AERA and any sorts of next steps we might take moving forward. I want to begin by introducing the panel, and I'm really thrilled to have these folks here with us today. So just going down from um, my left, Prudence Carter uh, from the University of California, Berkeley, Jeffrey Henning from Teachers College, Antar T. T. Chavakunda. Yes, sorry. I was so nervous to say it correctly, and then I hesitated. From University of, uh, he's just completed his degree at the University of Southern California, moving on to the University of Cincinnati. Dimitri Morgan from Loyola University, Chicago. Ana Martinez Alaman from Boston College. And Bill Tierney from the University of Southern California. As I hope you've seen, each of these individuals wrote an essay that's been posted on AER's website as a means to begin to think about the many different important issues that are embedded in these questions that we've already begun to pose. In our conversation, we're going to pull from these ideas, um, begin with conversation up here, and then open it up for questions as well. I want to begin by having us think about the challenges that are facing higher education and some of the threats to our core values. And these take many forms, and others are writing about these as well. So last week, there was an article in uh, University World News by Patrick Blessinger and Hans DeWitt. The title was Academic Freedom is Essential to Democracy. And then talking about the ways academic freedom has become more complex due to nationalist populist trends and the role of social media and fake news. This is something that you know, I've been thinking about, but I want to begin by having each of the panelists talk about some of the challenges that you're seeing facing higher education and the core values of our academy. So, students? All right, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for coming. So, um, I think it will, my comments will, will uh, come from my experience just recently as co-chairing a free speech commission at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, where in the past couple of years, if you've noticed in the media, um, public universities have actually been quite challenged by um, events on their campus from the alt-right. Um, and these events have created quite a bit of disruption on the campuses. Um, those, um, those events have been quite controversial. And in our case at Berkeley, um, we expended over $4 million um, in the context of a very strong fiscal uh, crisis um, to, one, um, maintain our obligation to the First Amendment and the right to free speech, including offensive and hateful speech, um, and to ensure that we didn't have the kind of outcome that the University of Virginia or Charlottesville actually experienced uh, when there was a protest there, protest march. Um, but at the same time, we've been grappling because we have principles of community. And our principles of community um, encompass a commitment to values of inclusion and diversity and um, maintaining a safe, integrous academic space for all members of our community. And so I think one of the biggest things that has come out of our deliberations as a, commu as, as, as a commission has been the tension that actually um, exist and has emerged between those, particularly public institutions, state institutions, that are trying to maintain their obligations to free speech, 
and, and hate speech is, in many ways are, is protected by the First Amendment, um, but also trying to maintain its commitment to its marginalized populations, the populations of individuals who have been, who have been in the forefront or in the spotlight of the national agenda, um, but not in very um, pretty or, or ways, not in um, very, um, in, in, in many ways, their very well-being been threatened, um, particularly for undocumented persons, for those persons who are transgender, for, for those persons who are Muslim, for those persons who are uh, black or of African descent. These are the populations that have also been also counter-protesting and been feeling very threatened. So I think the biggest thing is how do we reconcile those of us in the higher education, this issue of free speech, which was not written in the current moment, and I certainly don't think that the founding fathers were considering diversity of peoples um, as they were writing the, uh, the, 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 the Bill of Rights. Um, and, and so being within the law, being within the Constitution, adhering to it, and also enforcing a principles of community that allow us to be a more expansive, inclusive, deeply inclusive in university. So what we're trying to do is to, and, and we've recommended some concrete steps to the university about how to ameliorate um, the kind of dissension and dissent and, and divisiveness that we find on our campuses. And I can talk more about that in detail. But I think that's one of the biggest problems, as I see, is reconciling those principles of community with free speech. Great. Thank you. Jeff? So I, I think the biggest problem in my mind is the extreme polarization uh, politically and and not just the fact that we're so polarized, but the form that the polarization has begun to take where every position, every assertion of evidence, every uh, introduction of research is uh, first out the door evaluated by is this supporting the left or is this supporting the right? And as a result, it's contributing to, I think, a long-term erosion of confidence um, in the public, uh, uh, as far as how the public views research and evidence, but also within the academic community as to how we should situate ourselves in, in light of this sense of, of, uh, of outside attack and an attack on the legitimacy of what I think a lot of us want to do. And I'll just say, you know, there's some uh, good news and bad news. I'm trying in my mind to decide which should I go with first. Um, let, uh, so, so the the, the bad news is this, that um, when, when the public's asked about the, whether they trust science and scientists to um, consistently act in the public interest, only 5% of Americans say they put a great deal of trust in science. That's the bad news. The good news is, compared to other groups and other institutions, we're doing really well. <laughs> That's because a, lo a, a lot of people say, well, I sort of trust science. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, um, and overall, in terms of mistrust, um, we're the least mistrusted of any of the major institutions outside the military. In this room, maybe we change the ordering here. But, but I think that there is this general uh, um, uh, uh, challenge to the notion of expertise tied to claims of fact, the sense that, um, that researchers and the research community as a group is aligned in this battle. And that makes it challenging for us to walk a line. And I, I hope we'll have more to say about it. But I think the challenge is both in terms of how we deal with the outside, but also internally in terms of a measured uh, assessment of how do we speak strongly and authoritatively to protect the values and institutions that are critical to research uh, um, uh, without getting sucked totally into the uh, whirlpool of polarized politics. Um, yes, I, I think I'll probably talk about like uh, three things. I want to say like, uh, I think civility is something we need to talk about, spaces, and um, I think uh, outreach. Th those are three things I think. So I'll say civility. One of the questions I'm continually asking myself is, where do conversations happen from these polarized views, right? 
where can uh, someone who believes black lives matter talk with someone who believes that all lives matter? Where, does that, where is that space? Do we care about that space? Do we want that space to happen? Um, I'd imagine that hopefully, you know, uh, in a higher education context, that conversation could possibly happen. Um, but I think uh, we, we, civility is, is something we definitely need to work on, I think, on, uh, on both ends. Um, these are totally very heated topics and personal topics with good reason. But uh, I, at the end of the day, I think that conversation needs to happen at some, at some space. So then think about spaces. Where, where are these spaces uh, that these conversations can happen as well? Um, and I think given the prominent nature of social media, we often rely on echo rooms. We tweet, we tweet to our followers, we get these retweets from people who think like us. Um, we have trolls or people who think differently. Um, and, you know, sometimes we block them or we just don't, you know, respond to them. I think it's very easy to uh, stay in, com in the comfort of an echo room. Um, and that's not to say it's a bad thing, but uh, we, we want to feel safe. And I think we also need to question what it means to feel safe in, in, in general. Uh, lastly, think about outreach. When, I don't know if anyone read the uh, blog post, but I, when I was thinking about fake news, I thought about misinformation, and misinformation that's widespread with, that has a kind of politicized in, impact. And I thought, when I thought about fake news, I thought about, oh, um, I thought one of our uh, past president, um, President Obama, who said that we need to dispel the myth that uh, a black boy carrying a book is acting white. I was like, oh, I thought that myth has been dispelled, right? So I think how are we making this outreach to uh, people who aren't necessarily education scholars um, to let them know that you know we have research to dispel these myths and as education scholars, what, what do we see as misinformation that's coming from within as well? And I think we need to be rigorous about challenging that. Thank you. Uh, so a, a couple of thoughts as well. Uh, one. Uh, at, a, uh, at another education conference a few years ago, um, I, hear, I heard uh, Gary Rhodes, who's at the University of Arizona, uh, does a lot of work on um, academic capitalism and the role of faculty in the academy. Uh, and he made a point that has really stuck with me as an early career scholar uh, and also somebody whose own institution, you know, just last week uh, had a faculty walk out um, as non-tenure track faculty um, were sort of unionizing in response to uh, working conditions, and, and so the, the quote he gave was that uh, when it comes to issues of academic freedom, if we, we being faculty, researchers, uh, don't use it, we'll lose it. Uh, and, and it was a push um, to, to early career faculty, um, but also tenure faculty, because I, I think oftentimes there's this assumption that, oh, once I get tenure, then I'll do, you know, more risky research, and, you know, then I'll say things and push back on uh, politicians or, or, you know, people who um, you know, are, are not coming things from, are not coming from a perspective in an empirical way or are not grounding what they're saying in research. Um, but that work needs to start, you know, um, as, as soon as possible. Uh, and and no, notions of academic freedom, policies of academic freedom, uh, shouldn't just be tied to uh, tenure stream or tenure track faculty members. Um, and, I, and I think the ways in which um, the entity and concept of academic freedom plays out in the next few years is going to be really consequential um, for what the academy can do in response to, to a fake news era. Um, the, the other piece is um, thinking about, you know, I think um, I see the, the free speech uh, tensions and shouting down of campus speakers um, a little bit differently from um, Dr. Carter because I, um, I spent this past summer mapping, um, so I do some work with G GIS, and spent the past summer mapping where were campus speakers being shouted down. Um, at, at what institutions were, was this happening? What speakers um, what was this happening uh, with? And, and, you know, Berkeley was one of the hotbeds of that, so it would make sense that conversation was there. Um, but almost two-thirds of, of these incidences were happening in uh, California, Illinois, New York, and Texas. Um, at almost some of the same institutions where speakers on a circuit were going to these institutions and, and sort of riling students up and causing these things. Um, and so I, I don't want to say that the free speech issue is, is overblown, um, but I think conversations about civility, conversations about how we engage uh, and prepare students to uh, engage in a democracy is a purpose that higher education sort of needs to reclaim um, and really think about the, the apolitical turn that I would argue we've taken over the last 20 years 
and think about how we're really preparing students to engage in a, in a polarized uh, in, in, in a polarized setting and what institutions' responsibilities are in, in doing that. Um, and then the last piece uh, is, I often think about the sort of depolitization of, of academic work to fit in with funders' demand to, to, to be, um, to, to try to, you know, make impacts in, in ways where we're sort of following the money uh, versus doing work um, that might be, see as might be seen as political, might be um, put down or, or not um, taken advantage of in the top tier journals, um, but is really pushing our thinking and informing how we think theoretically and intellectually about really important topics that um, you, you know I, I think a lot about scholars in higher education that are, are pushing us to really think about trans inclusion um, and how you know at the start of my graduate career that wasn 't even a concept that I really understood, uh, and now it 's you know at least on the conversation you see gender neutral restrooms at conferences and so where is the work going on right now um, that may be seen as scary or too political that we really need to be investing in and pushing our boundaries? And, and I think the ARA and, and higher education needs to embrace those areas instead of trying to, to marginalize them. Um, honestly, my list was very long. Uh, I think we have lots of challenges. Uh, and I, what I chose to focus on in my essay I think resonates with everything that's been said before. Um, honestly, I do think that we have to we have to take ourselves to task on what constitutes provocative speech in higher education and what's its place in higher education. And that, for me, is linked more to what I tried to focus on in my essay, and that's that this isn't new. Um, that the contempt, unpopularity of the intellect is not new in the United States, uh, historically. Um, you know, we can look back and point to eras where the intellectual, the academic, um, certainly was feared. Uh, we certainly have times in our um, not so distant historic past where there was a real sense that we should fear the expert. Um, honestly, I guess, because somehow experts would run amok uh, and tyranny would abound. Um, if you can imagine all of us ruling the world, that's what I think people were afraid of, which, you know, it has, it has its place, I suppose. Uh, but at the core of that is, well, what is, you know, what's the role of the intellectual, the academic, the expert, in a democratic society. And then how does that map on to, well, how is it that, as was raised earlier, that a democratic populace uh, can feel that it can trust the expert, right? That it shouldn't be afraid of the expert, that the expert brings to democratic society um, certain tools, certain um, ways of engaging in democratic spaces that isn't ethereal, that is very practical, how to build a dam, how to make the internet much more reasonably priced for all of its citizens. These are all questions that rely on experts. So for me it was, well, how do I communicate the meaning of expertise, right? How is it that it's, you know, in this question of how do we get our research out into the public, um, for me it was more like, well, how do I communicate the meaning of science, the meaning of what we understand the GIS is telling us, or what we understand, um, you know, a particular research certainly at this conference on how students progress and the ways in which they progress how it is that cognitive science enables us to figure out that um, students learn in particular ways through particular means, and on and on and on and on and on. We can all have a very long list of that. I don't think we do a great job at that. Uh, and I think, for me, it really has come down to, well, how do I educate my own, right? How do I educate my own students to then educate other students and send it on down the line around the meaning of expertise and the meaning of fact, uh, to then be able to debate it. And I think part of the polarization is a real fear for not the expert, but that 
the meaning hasn't been very well communicated. I think we've done a poor job of that, quite frankly. Um, so, I don't know, my bottom line is that I fear that higher education, but also K-12, and I'm not pointing any fingers at who's, the, the causality is, is complex, but has really engaged, I would say, in the last 30 years in the art of education as consumption, um, and not on analysis. Thank you. Uh, let's acknowledge that we live in a new world or better or worse. So I have two thoughts about this. For, you know, for, for most of my career, I have had an extremely broad interpretation of academic freedom. And I have no problems with people who I ardently disagree with coming to my campus or my classroom and, and talking. Um, I believe in climate change. I have no problems with a climate change denier coming. I would have no problems with someone who supports the current administration to come and argue. But um, recently I've spent a, some time writing about affirmative or academic freedom and um, I've been perusing conspiracy websites. And I encourage you to do that. What I am not willing to argue about is that Hillary Clinton it has a pedophile ring in the basement of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. And we can laugh about that, but there are millions of people who believe that. I'm not willing to debate that. I'm not willing to have that person come and normalize that kind of discourse. So what do we do? Tragically, on my own campus a year or two ago, a student, a graduate student, killed a, a professor. Um, it, was, it was a mental issue, obviously. But from that, the university has created a threat assessment team. And it's a very active group that's trying to do what its title is. It's trying to assess threats. I think we need to do the same thing with regard to academic freedom. I think there needs to be a quite active academic freedom team that looks at these things and says, this is going to create controversy, and how do we protect this so that this is not creating enormous problems on our campus. But also, let's draw a line and say, this is just ridiculous. We're not going to have these folks come just because they want to create havoc. That's one issue. The second issue to me is that uh, academic freedom has been around in the United States, enshrined in the United States for about a century now. And, uh, you know, obviously the the idea of academic freedom uh, is enshrined because of the protections that tenure provides, ostensibly. Mm -hmm. I know all the shortcomings of tenure, but I have been at my own university now for about 23 years. When I came in my school, there were about 80% of the faculty were tenured, 20% were non-tenured. Today, we have 80% who are non-tenured, 20% who were tenured. If you want to protect something, you you got to have a force, and that's tenure. And I absolutely agree with the person who said, if you don't use it, what Gary's point is, if you don't use it, then you're going to lose it. But if the last person with tenure needs to turn the lights out, we're in big trouble, and we're not being vociferous enough about that. Great. Thank you. So lots of ideas have come out here. Um, I'm going to unpack a couple. So. Um, one of the, the ideas that came out uh, in what you all just talked about has been around the role of the expert in a democratic society. I think Anna said that. Um, thinking about the nature of research, Dimitri talked about you know, how we make choices about that. Prudence, in your essay you raised a question, how do we remain relevant and continue to make research matter? And so I'd like to ask a question about how we should think as educational researchers about the production of research, you know, our role with regard to that responsibility that we have. And I'll start with you, Prudence, first. Sure. <clears throat> sure, thanks. So there are a couple of things that I, I think. Um, I, I've been engaged in a study in the, in the past years over how uh, federal policymakers use research, uh, particularly as they were thinking about the reauthorization of e, uh, e, um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. 
And one of the things that came out of this uh, interview, these interviews with elites, was the extent to which we um, can translate our research. So that's a communications thing. But they also stressed that they were, it was really important for our work to remain steadfast to rigor and systematic analysis. And so that was one of the things that, 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 that I wrote about in my essay. But that, can I talk about something sure. else that I've learned since I've written that essay? I, so when I thought about this panel and doing my homework, I actually went back to some of the cognitive psychology research. I wanted to understand how is it that people really um, continue to believe in fake news or believe things that are untrue. There is a long body of psychological literature that suggests that it's now called the illusory truth effect. Um, and there are people like Gordon uh, Pennycock at Yale University psychologist, uh, Linda Fazio at Vanderbilt, people who are actually studying cognitively um, the connections between memory and learning. And what the science is showing robustly is that we as individuals, if we hear something repeatedly, even if it's false, and even if you intervene the truth, you try to inject the truth because of something that goes on in our mind, if we hear it over and over again, we'll continue to believe it's true. And so they are now suggesting that some of the strategies that we're using to undo the power of fake news has to be, they have to be more drastic. It's not enough to just put a bunch of truth in front of people and say this is the truth because there's something that happens cognitively with shortcuts. So the more we're hearing it, and I think so we're going to have to engage with the psychology at the individual level. The second thing, and this is actually germane to something that I raised in my, my, my essay, is a sociological observation. The science, the research is showing, and this is also uh, uh, congruent with something that was said earlier, that we are living in echo chambers. This implicates segregation truly. Most of us have overwhelmingly ideologically segregated networks. And the research studies are showing that among those who consider themselves Republican, only about 20% of their friends in their Facebook networks are ideologically different. And among Democrats, it's like 18%. So there's not, no difference there. And one of the things that came out of the last election, I think a lot of us were surprised by the patterns, and some of us may not have been surprised. But I think what a sociological implication was, for me, was the extent to which we haven't done enough research in education and the social, various social sciences around understanding others who are not the population we so fixate on in educational research, and I've said this publicly several times, we are spending a lot of time understanding the minority, the marginalized, and we're ignoring large bodies of people in the Midwest and the Northern Plains and rural and semi-rural areas. I don't think it's either or, but I want to understand why these demographics are behaving the way they are and electing people the way they are who impact social policy that will affect my well-being and the well-being of those who are less marginalized. So we have to do more work and bring that to the forefront. And we also have to attend to the segregation. And so those are my two points, is how are we going to think about psychology and, and, and sociology, so to speak, and the implications of that, so with research. But at the same time, remaining steadfast the values of rigorous research, because I don't think they're policymakers, they, they're influenced by the notions of evidence-based research, um, but it's maybe thinking about where our myopia is, or where it lies as a research community, and what we don't understand. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I just want to, so Prudence introduced uh, psychology and sociology. And I just want to, as I'm a political scientist, so I, you know, I'm gonna, I want to bring in a political connection to this. Um, and, and it relates to this issue of, of how people process information. Um, and it's a, a, a distinct point from Antar's point about uh, zones or bubbles of, of information, because I do think that's important in the social media world and things like that. But there have been a series of uh, survey experiments uh, by political scientists that have looked at what happens when you provide information presented as facts um, 
in terms of how it does or doesn't change people's views on some key issues that they come into uh, the experience with. Um, so this is a case of people, a, a, a random selection of people getting the same information presented the same way, the same facts within a survey. Uh, and what's troubling is, uh, to me, is, is that, um, that people interpret that same information in terms of their priors and came to totally different conclusions about what the facts were. And what drove, as much as anything, is identified by this research, that is partisan identity. So strong Democrats and strong Republicans heard the same fact. It wasn't just, in other words, that they heard different facts on different media. And it wasn't just that they said, I don't believe that one side, and I believe that the other side. It's they incorporated that evidence in a different way to support the views that they started out with. So I think that that also interacts with some of the uh, 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 troubling aspects we see in terms of public discourse. Yeah, so the only point that I'll add briefly is, is that I think the, the way that we communicate research is, is critically important. And, and I think that this idea that the, you know, journal article or the you know, book chapter or the book um, is going to be compelling um, to whether it's policymakers or just the, the general public um, is, a, is a real disconnect between sort of where academia stands and um, where you know, I would argue society is moving. Um, you know, if you look at some of the most popular, popular press outlets like BuzzFeed or um, Huffington Post or um, even some of the stuff that the New York Times is doing with, with data vi visualizations, you know, articles that are just in list form. So, you know, the top 10, the top 10 things, um, using blogs to be, to be responsive. Um, and, and, and so the way that the academy sort of privileges knowledge because of the rigor question versus what is, you know, quick and responsive that can then be generated at a, at a clip that allows people to hear it over and over again in a, in a lot of different venues. I think is a, is a huge disconnect that we have to figure out how to try to rectify. Um, and and I'm, I'm concerned because the, the two competing demands, I, I, I think we can be creative and it can be both and, but I think very often um, you know, people who do public scholarship, people who are engaged on social media get seen as sort of less than academics or less than you know, intellectuals or less than experts than the people who you know, have 500 publications in top tier journals. And so I'm concerned about the messages that we send early career scholars, graduate students, uh, people that want to be involved in, in the production of, of a body of knowledge that could be seen as truth versus the, the very narrow ways we codify what is knowledge and how and, and the venues that we do that. Um, and, and those competing purposes, I, you know, I think we can be creative about how to reconcile them, but I'm concerned that we're not adaptable enough in this environment to, to respond to how quickly issues change and to put out statements and to be really thoughtful about it when you know, we're hacking away at a, at a book manuscript or a journal manuscript in the world is happening around us and other people are, are capturing that moment and then our voices aren't um, in that conversation until well after the fact. I think about this in terms of um, how do I get to use the name professor? So, you know, if a newspaper calls me or the radio wants to interview me about um, what do I think about how the Dodgers can turn around their, their current horrible losing streak, I don't think I get to say that this is Professor William Tierney coming to you. But I do know a fair amount about college readiness. Now, again, what Dimitri said is true. I, I need to know not simply how to get things published in, in refereed articles, but also communicate in ways that, that are successful, and that's a learning strategy for me. But I think we often fool ourselves, especially in this association, that I can only use the word professor when I have a scientific basis for saying things. And especially at this moment in time, when we have an administration that puts forward a travel ban 
that says particular foreign peoples cannot come to this country. And I am a member at a university where we have more faculty, staff, and students of Iranian descent than any other university in America. For me not to say something as Professor Tierney is disgraceful. For me not to push the administration to come out and speak on behalf of them is disgraceful. And it's also bad public policy. I know about higher education. If we want to maintain preeminence, we need foreigners in our universities. And for me to remain silent simply because that's not a particular area of my expertise is a mistake. I think that we've all heard, you know, how it is that we should be, right, you know, talking to various forms of press, et cetera, et cetera, and how we need to um, sort of get out of our own academic speak, for lack of a, of a more generalized way of doing it. And I, and I think that's all true. Um, I was talking to my sister, who's been um, a political strategist uh, for well over 30 years, um, and occasionally we run into, like, she'll email me and ask me what something means, right? Because she's got to prep her candidate, blah, 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 blah. Um, but we had this very interesting conversation um, and about, well, you know, I always tell you what it means, um, but what do you do with it? And she said, well, then I have to then interpret, then I have to take that and interpret it and give it to the big ball, you know, the, the candidate, basically. And I said, okay, well, how does that happen? She says, well, I have to figure out how it is that I know what you're saying and blah, 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 blah. So I said, oh, so I do have to do a better job of that. I said, yeah, you do, but what you're better off doing actually is figuring out what versions of me there are for what you want to get done, right? Because part of our problem is that, and she said local, like she said, think locally. You know, how it is that we don't actually engage face-to-face -face with, the local whatever, you know, so in this case, talking to um, one of the chief officers in the Department of Education in the city of New York about a particular thing, and she echoed my sister, she goes, well, yeah, you need to talk to me, and you need to talk to so-and-so, because that's the only way, and you have to communicate it in this way. It was very clear to me at that moment that that's, oh, right, and I don't have, and by the way, we're not trained to do that. So maybe my role now is, do I, how do I train my graduate students to do that? Yeah. Real quick. I mean, yeah. It, it, it's one, of, one of the things that I, I found fascinating coming into my program was that, you know, we're, we're a group of m many education scholars, but a, a, a decent amount of people, I think, weren't really uh, comfortable with education and the acts and process of education. Mm -hmm. So I, I taught for a couple of years, you know, and I mean, one of the, the main things I learned was meeting students where they were. You know, and I think we have to remember that as education scholars, that education is still at the, at the root of what we do. And also as an educator, you learn about scaffolding. Like I, I can't tell someone who, you know, who, who says like, oh yeah, all, all lives matter. I can't start spouting off like, you know, Derek Bell, racial realism, just like that, you know. Um, so I think it's just kind of remembering that. And I mean, I, I use this quote fairly often when I think about this, um, but uh, Borges, this, uh, Poet was uh, was speaking to Harvard uh, students about poetry and authors who wrote about poetry, and they, he said they seemed to write about poetry like they didn't love it. And he said that I had the uh, the uh, the un unfortunate feeling that I was reading a book on astronomy from astronomers who had never looked at the stars, right? So I, I think as you know, higher education scholars and scholars in general of education, are we forgetting that education is at the root of what we're doing? So, uh, you know, I've been thinking about these issues around our roles in a variety of different forms, and um, you know, one of the frameworks I have had in my mind is about our role in the production of research, our role in the communication of research, and our role in the use of research. Um, I'm going to use this as an opportunity for a plug. For So these, what people, people here have offered really useful reflections, and there's some additional, uh, there's 16 reflections in this book, Taking It to the Streets, the role of scholarship and advocacy and advocacy and scholarship, and there's some flyers up here. Um, but one takeaway is that there, is, there are multiple ways to do this, and many people are trying to figure out 
what are the right ways to connect research to policy and advocacy in different types of venues and different types of situations. Um, so it's really nice to hear people reflect on how you're, how you're all trying to do this. Um, you know, one of the issues that sometimes people um, worry about or perhaps uh, get hung up on is distinctions between, and Bill mentioned you know, the title of professor, but um, distinction between researcher, advocate, public intellectual. I'm wondering if anyone has any reflections on those different types of labels and how you think about them or how we might think about them as individuals or community. <laughs> um, well, I want to use that as a chance to make a distinction that I find useful uh, and that, that's uh, lurking behind what, what a lot of folks have said already, and that's between these issues of how we resolve them as individuals who are researchers and how we act as a, a collective body of researchers and the role of AERA and other organizations. Um, and I think those are, are different, and so I'd say, just to Laura's point here on the individual, I, I think there's room for, not only room for, a need for us to be placing ourselves at different points along these spectrums. Okay? They're, you know, they're indivi as individuals, there are tough issues about how closely do you wed your research agenda with your visions of, of social values and social good. And I think there's room for and a need for people to put themselves at different points of that continuum. On the issue of communication, I think there are tough questions for individuals about uh, where on the continuum between talking to folks just in your discipline or in a particular journal niche versus going out and talking uh, to policymakers or to the public. And I think it's not only okay, but it's good if people are placing themselves in different places there. Good because I think, I just generally hear one of my values is intellectual pluralism of various kinds, and I think the exchange of ideas and exchange of positions is good. Good politically, I think, for the outside that, uh, that we counter the perception on the part of many outside that the academic community is all of one mind, that we walk together on every issue. I think we need to, um, you know, uh, show some uh, interest in engaging in different issues. Now that's different from the question of what do we do as a, as a collective, and I, I, and I don't want to go on too long now, I hope we'll come back to it, but I do think we have a, a separate set of issues to think about when we're talking about how do we position ourselves collectively. Um, I've come to the view that we do need to engage in politics, that as researchers, we kind of think politics is nasty and it's the stuff that drives all the bad things that are happening. But I do think that there's a difference between bad politics and good politics. And good politics, to me, is about deliberation, coming to agreement, negotiation, compromise among groups with different interests and values. I think we do need to act politically, but I think we need to do it in a very focused and disciplined way, which is not to get pulled into every social issue as education researchers or as the research community, but to carefully begin to talk about what really are the core values and institutions we need for research to thrive and to be productive and set our politi collective political agenda around communicating and protecting those. Individual, I do want to come back to the collective. No, myself, I've I've been wrestling with these uh, these kinds of uh, my own identity issues uh, for a, a while. And what I will say is, I do think it's important to to differentiate among and go uh, thinking about what it means to be a scholar and a researcher, and what does it mean to be, and then when you add different descriptors like what it means to be a public scholar or a public intellectual. And I think there is a great deal of overlap, um, but there are some distinctions. And, um, and what does it mean to be a public educator? Um, what is, and also higher education versus those who are in primary or, or, or secondary. And so sometimes I, we're doing a little conflation up here, and I think it's important for us to kind of uh, parse things out. So I think what we're talking about right now is at the higher ed level. And the identity, and I do personally have some concerns about the proliferation. Um, I love the democratization of the internet and of social media. It, today, anybody can put anything out there, right? 
Um, but I do worry about the production of the next generation of scholars and researchers who are not well prepared and who see themselves wanting to go from zero to 100 in a minute and becoming the most famous you know, social media stars and haven't quite gotten their feet under themselves around the foundation of how to do systematic well, I mean, um, analysis or, or, or really well-grounded research designs or have their minds around what the really deep theoretical and conceptual frameworks that they're engaging with. Um, I'm starting to see a lot more kind of descriptive research based on what I see filtered through my lenses. And, and so people are going to ask in this era of fake news, how do you know that? And you have to be able to under you have to be able to prove or events to convince people that you have some kind of solid methodological foundation, some rigor analysis under it, particularly within the academy, particularly if you want to play in this sandbox of the academy, right? Because you're going to have those academic standards through which you're reviewed. Now, it may be different in the public. We know that people will believe anything. And if you have a very strong, articulate, charismatic voice, you can say anything, but you will undermine your credibility from your other playmates. And so I worry, I, I, I do think that it's important in, in, my, in my, my estimation, that it's important for us to train the next generation of scholars and researchers to be kind of multiliterate, to be multidiscursive. Um, you know, there's the op-ed project that trains people how to effectively write op-eds to translate your research. I love Katie Orenstein's project, right? Here, it's based here in New York. She goes around the country with her team training scholars how to take their research and translate it into more effective pieces for various venues. I think we need to know how to do that. Some of us are better at speaking and articulating these things. Some of us are better at data visualization and creating programs and things like that. Some of us can write blogs and do blogs. There are all kinds of discursive kinds of techniques that we can use. But the foundation, I believe, and I'm a traditionalist in that way, still has to be, you have to be solidly trained and steeped in your theoretical and methodological um, 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 skills. And I think I, we can't lose that. I don't want that to be lost. This is, a, this is a strange thing because this is a serious conversation, but in many respects right now, I think this is, a, this is a fun problem for me. And it's a fun problem in the sense that uh, since I've been here, I went to the Whitney because I, I really like art. Floor 5, the Grant Wood thing is really quite remarkable. And I'm reading uh, Carson McCullers, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Beautiful book, century old. So that's the advocacy part, and that's different, right, from me being a professor. I'm also writing a book now on relational sociology and education, because I'm trying not, nothing to advocate, I'm just trying to think through, is there a better way to think about the issues that I'm concerned about using this new analytic tool and, and a methodological tool. And then there is the advocacy part in terms of in ter college readiness, what do I do with regard to uh, undocumented students. And it's not simply figuring out by research what to do, but also in terms of how do I work with those students and advocate for them. The thing that's interesting to me is that because of social media, it's hard to, to isolate my, myself. And uh, for a, um, another month, Antar is still my, my graduate student and Dr. Antar, I should say, teacher of Akunda. And I tend to think because of today, he, he would know normally, just in the way we talk with one another, that I have gone to the Whitney or that I am reading Carson McCullers. And he would know that I'm working on relational sociology even though he's not. And then this other stuff that he's doing. And I think actually, it has made our relationship stronger rather than weaker, that he sees me and I see him as more complete, fuller individuals. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge to figure out where, you know, where should this just be the professor-graduate student relationship and what do I cordon off and that he doesn't get to see. And it's, that has, in the time I've been an academic, that has really changed a lot. 
to Carter's point, because it's one that I think, you know, if I'm being honest, convicts me. Um, be, because I think, you know, while getting steeped in the methodological training and, and doing all of those things, right, like the Black Lives Matter movement is happening, right? People are taking stands on issues out in the public sphere that intersect, um, you know, with the issues and communities that I care about. Um, and, 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 I, and I think, and I wrote a little bit uh, about this in, in my statement or my blog post of, you know, how, as an early career scholar, you know, what am I learning from the sort of generation of scholars that came before me and what things am I sort of taking and, and repeating and trying to emulate and versus what am I trying to do differently? Um, and how, um, with what I know and, and my experiences, am I trying to, to forge a different path to, you know, maybe rectify some of the uh, challenges and concerns of, of, of my era? Um, and, and so that tension, you know, bothers me, right? Because I, I, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with you. But at the same time, I think, you know, how I read that is, you know, sort of do this work over here while people are, you know, being shot by police still, right? are being, um, you know, taken to task for having ideas um, or, um, you know, gender identities outside of a, of, of a binary, um, but do this re really rigorous. And I know that's not what you're saying, so I don't want to, you know, put words, but I, I think that's how it, it's read sometimes um, to early career scholars of, you have to do this work over here and these other things you can, can get to in due time. Um, and so I would love as an association at, in the way that we train uh, graduate students and the way that we mentor and guide early career scholars to sort of help us muddy through how to do that well um, and how to do that sensitive to how quickly the public sphere is changing because I, I think that that's one that convicts me all the time and, and, I am, and I am very guilty of at times being more in the public space than the, the, the sort of empirical scholarship space because of this burden I feel and duty I feel to my community to sort of be involved in those conversations. Um, you know, at the same time that I was talking, I texted Antar last year where I was at the Boys and Girls Club volunteering, and I was like, hey, we're using your college access and college readiness, you know, gain to help the students learn about how to get to college, right? You know, it, I wasn't writing about it, I wasn't doing it, but I was in the Boys and Girls Club using the research of, you know, other scholars to, to help students think about college going. And, and is that, would, have, would my time have been better spent working on a journal article? You know, I think some people would say, yeah. But at the same time, I was, you know, in uptown Chicago, you know, trying to help students in my community get to college. And so how do we reconcile those tensions is, is a real challenge for me. So I don't have the answer, and I, and, I, and, I, and I know what Dr. Carter is saying, but I think that's something we need to think about as an association and as a field, how we rec reconcile those tensions. And I would say that one of the ways in which I see it in my graduate students, um, and I'll put it out there, it's a little bit of a burn in my saddle, um, and it gets to this issue around it, rigor and being able to move across what I, I think is very, very true. I've never been able to answer when am I a scholar, professor, and when am I an advocate. It's sort of all, you know, having said that, I do find that where many, most of my graduate students first stumble is in being able to articulate a very rigorous, sound, coherent argument for the relevance of whatever question they want to answer. And it can be what you may want to term, you know, so, um, something that is, is, is socially important to you, right? And it's like, okay, great, now how would you argue that, right? What's the relevance and to whom and why? Um, and I find that that is work that oftentimes doesn't get done. I, I don't know how else to say it, that we don't put that kind of time. W many of us do lots of time with regard to the rigor of the actual methods, right, because we're fussy that way. But, you know, I often say, you know, it's sort of like getting to the, the issue of what constitutes politics. Well, there's a lot of work on the definition of politics in Western history. How do we define it, right? Because politics is actually what we're doing at this very moment, right? It really is what politics is. But many of my students don't have that kind of foundation in the ways of articulating and thinking about and framing 
something like the relevance of this particular research question that I find, you know, we need to do better with. Here, because I, I want to just clarify something, and I, I'm glad this tension is here. I like debate. There's been a lot of debate here at this meeting. Um, but I, I, I want to clarify something. I have, I have tried to, I've been writing about for, um, in my first book manuscript, I believe we all embody multiple identities. We ha we're multifaceted. And we can have a primary identity, but we are multifaceted. And I think this is something Bill was trying to say earlier, is that, Dimitri, I, be I sincerely believe that you don't have to pit one part of yourself against another. I mean, I'm walking in a body trying to do all of these things, too, and wrestling with them. And you're going to be read differently, uh, depending, but you can be multifaceted. And the reason why I have to underscore why it's important to know the science and to develop yourself as a researcher, even if it's about saving lives, is if you want to affect change and do anything to change the agents of the state who are actually executing this kind of state-sanctioned violence against black bodies, you need to understand the psychology of those persons. You need to understand what does it do? How can you actually affect any kind of behavior or change on people who make decisions and who act? Or you, or you need to engage with the research around that because that affects the practice. And so uh, what I'm saying is that we have to build our body of knowledge and we have to generate knowledge. There are incredible researchers like Jennifer Eberhardt at Stanford who's working with, or, or who's working with um, uh, police departments in Oakland trying to actually affect change in that system. These are people who are engaging with people on the street affecting black lives. That research I want to know, and I want to also know how to um, unpack it to understand what the methods around it and how that translates to practice. And then there are pieces of research that could be actually complementary to that. And so I wouldn't want people to, and how you translate that into the classroom, how you help un, young people understand that, how you help young people actually to be empowered to build on and say why that research may not matter, why that research needs to do that. I think that can be all of us. I don't believe that it's necessary to say, okay, so it's urgent and lives are, 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 and I just need to be in the streets and I need to protest and I need to do this now. I think we can be, it's not either or. And so I just want to make sure. Now, how you do that effectively, this is where we have a problem in the educational community. We have a one size fit all model in almost every aspect of education. We don't think in multi discursive, multimodal, um, and, uh, ways a lot of the time. And that's what we need to do in education. And, 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 and it's also not just, I'm going to keep coming back, the multimodality means we also need to change our settings, we need to diversify our settings so that we can understand the entire system and how it all plays together. Because no matter how much my heart is in saving black lives, saving transgender lives, saving any um, undocumented students' lives, making sure it's better, you, I'm going to be preaching to the choir if I don't figure out how to understand the other. And that's important, I think. That's great. Uh, and so implied in some of these last comments are things that we might do with regard to uh, training and educating the next generation of scholars. I'm wondering, uh, some of the comments that you've made earlier touched on our, our role for those of us who are teaching, right? How we engage in the classroom around these issues I want to go back back to this notion of um, engaging in discourse around when we have polarized uh, views on things. You know, what is our role, and I th Dimitri? I think you said uh, how we uh, help build a civil society and things like that. So we're in this environment where people don't. We're in, if we want to make a difference, we have to be able to communicate with people who disagree with us. And so, how do we help our students and? even ourselves, think about how to do this better. Any uh, suggestions, reflections on this? I guess I'll, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, one of the things, I, I was really interested in the idea of like safety when I first started uh, my program. And um, I forgot the name of the scholar, I'm so sorry, but uh, she said that we need to let go of the idea of safety and safety in safe spaces and think about safer spaces. Right, and, and then start thinking about safe like that, like uh, creating 
a safer space in the classroom as a process. Um, and that never at one moment will everyone completely feel like comfortable and learning cognitively. You have to go through some type of crisis to get to the next level. So inherently, uh, like the classroom, if you're doing the thing, things correctly, should be uncomfortable. Um, so I think just how do we uh, preface or how do we lay the groundwork for classrooms and spaces to begin with it is very is critical. Um, and I, I think yeah, a lot of it has to do with the language that we use. So if we say, oh yeah, this is a safe space, I want you to feel comfortable talking about these issues. No, like you, you should feel uncomfortable, and I think that's a that's a good thing. Um, I, I think uh, you know, especially in this time period, you know, when we when we deal with issues of race and thinking about race. Um, and it's very intimate to so many people, we have to be that much more um, uh, concerted in our efforts to talk about research. Um, I, I mean, I, that's one of the things I'm kind of thinking about now when I'm teaching like a diversity and equity in higher ed class, like how much am I bringing, like, you know, how much am I gonna say like, okay, anecdotal experience, how much are you bringing that in, right? How much are we relying on literature and theory? Uh, personally, like one of my favorite courses, I took a social theory course, uh, the uh, professor didn't allow, he's like, all right, we're not going to do any uh, personal experiences. And at first I was like, oh, oh, like, okay. But it, it was great for me to kind of put different people in conversation, different scholars in conversation with each other. And I felt like I learned it that much. I learned the ideas that much, uh, that much more. And so I think, I mean, that's one of the things I want to try to learn how to do as I get into the professoriate. But how can we use theory, put theorists against each other, and then have those fruitful conversations, um, maybe in that in that uh, same classroom or later. Um, that's definitely something I want to think about. So my students um, generally, uh, let's say in a topic like inequality, you know, getting into higher education, higher education access, can, are pretty decent, pretty good at making the moral argument. Um, it's wrong, to, you know, basically. Uh, and I make it very clear, it's sort of like there'll be no personal experiences, like you can't make the moral argument in the class. You have to give me the argument that's economic, and I run down the list, and ultimately you have to answer, so what? Why should we care about this? And part of that is getting to this very point, you know, how is it that you're arguing very coherently? What's your data? How is it connected? And ultimately, what is the so what? Is it for what purpose? Towards what good? Right now, ultimately, obviously, you get back to the moral argument that's much more about democratic citizenship, civil discourse, or whatever it is. But it's that challenge because it's very easy for students, as it is for us, it's not just them, to be able to say, well, it's it, you know, it's wrong to you know not enable the poor to get to higher education. I just believe that. It's like, well, why? So what? So they don't go to college. So what? Two quick points on this. One, um, one of my, so I am not a fan, or I, I don't look forward to um, the national crises that have happened. Um, but one of the things that I have really enjoyed um, in the last few years is that when there has been something, um, especially on, in the social media space, um, scholars and non-scholars alike have gotten together to crowdsource uh, syllabi around a particular topic. Um, and that for me has been so enlightening and has exposed me to so many readings and you know, poetry and data visualizations and um, just information that I that, you know, didn't learn in, in, in my you know, graduate education, um, but has also helped me continue to sort of stay up to date with what's, with what's there in a different way than you know, getting an email alert that then, you know, the new journal is out. Um, and so that's something that you know, I, I hope continues, ho hopefully not always around or in response to a, a, a crisis, but, um, you know, as far as a learning strategy, crowdsourcing information and being able to leverage social media um, it is one of the, you know, really good things um, a, a, about that space. And then th something that I think I've been thinking about a lot recently is I taught for the, this first time um, this past spring with a teaching assistant um, who holds very different social identities from me, identifies as a woman, Latinx, um, mother of, of um, two children. So he have, has been in the field of higher education for 20 plus years, um, and is now in a graduate program. Um, and so we have very different 
worldviews, different styles, but being in the classroom together, being able to play off each other, being able to engage tensions, um, I think has been really good for the students. And so I think a lot about our, at least in the higher education space, but maybe also arguably in the K-12 space, how we still privilege the sort of teacher as expert model and sort of the, the all-knower that gets to you know, pass on information to the blank slates of the students. Um, and how might we in the classroom space really rethink, you know, we, we espouse interdisciplinary research all the time, but what does interdisciplinary teaching look like and how do we incentivize and um, encourage people to, to do that? And I know there are some models um, out there of team teaching and, um, you know, bringing in guest lectures and speakers, but, you know, having somebody each class in the classroom to really engage and go off that, engage the tensions and the different experiences um, I think has been really valuable. So now I'm trying to figure out how do I, you know, after this semester, continue to have that, not just in a teaching assistant realm, but how would we do that with two professors or, you know, uh, uh, a person that's working in a sector or in, in, in industry and having them every week be there for the students, um, I think would be really transformative to, to some of these conversations. I, um, I don't know if you saw Deborah Ball's presidential talk, but I, I really liked it. I, I, didn't agree with all of it, but I really thought it was superb. And a lot of it revolved around a minute and a half tape that she had of um, her teaching children, I, I think they were second graders, of, uh, and it was two little girls um, talking about fractions. And in the minute and a half, she said there were something like 20 possible interventions where the teacher could say something or not say something. And that, it really made me think, because that's not just in second grade, that's like, in, every, in all my classes, that's like that. And I, and I don't have an answer here, but it, this year, I think, has been the, the most difficult year in terms of interventions, or what you say or what you don't say. Um, because, you know, for myself, in a, in a graduate class, I want them to master the material. I mean, I've got a lot of reading, and I want them to understand the reading, and I work pretty hard on writing, um, but there's all these other things going on. So if a student walks in, in the classroom wearing a, a Make America Great Again hat, just as an example, and he, and he walks in the room wearing that hat not to piss people off, because if, he, if somebody does that, I have an easier... I can understand how to handle that. But if the person just put the hat on because he happens to like the guy and he's got 10 different hats and he chose that hat the morning, and he's not trying to make a political statement, but he's got the hat in his head. Whatever I do, even if I do nothing, is an intervention. And it impedes learning or increases learning, but it Im impacts learning. And it's just the sort of thing that this year, more than any year since I've been an academic, I've had to think about these things before, during, and after class. Because all my classes are seminars where I'm trying to talk to people. Listen to people is really what I'm trying to do. And it's really tough right now because of the environment we have. Yeah, discretion. Discretion. This is where, this is where I see... Uh, I, you know, I'm going to call harp back on this and go back to my sociology. Where do we have to go in the United States to be able to ameliorate some of these conditions? Um, and we may or may not. And I, I try not to be too idealistic, but I do think that we are going to have to think more radically in American society if we don't want to be talking about these same things in 50 years. And I think the American Democratic Project in education and in school communities has to fundamentally revisit how we create communities of difference in our most intimate spaces, radically. That means in terms of, I'm not talking about diverse schools and communities. I am talking about deeply inclusive and integrated communities and schools. Because that's where the mass socialization starts. And that's where, and the implications for education and teaching and learning is in our schools of education and our various teacher training programs. 
We then will have more teacher candidates coming if we can get to that solid structural foundation who have been accustomed to difference and other and different perspectives and we can teach more effectively because what's happening now, in my opinion and based on my assessment of research, is that we're training lots of people to go into classrooms to teach people who are different from them and we're all products of segregated contexts that are ideologically homogenous. And so I'm not sure, Bill and colleagues, if we're gonna be able to figure out how to really reconcile this problem until we figure out, and I am a structuralist, until we figure out how the very foundations of how we live can change in American society. Now, we can do it to an extent. There are lots of programs and there are some intervention spaces in some communities that do it much better than others. But I think in terms of scale, in terms of our nation, what we're seeing, this is the most politically divisive time for my, me, and I'm not that old, but my, when I talk to my parents and my older relatives, they said they've never felt that this work. That I am the product of the Deep South. And when my parents, who are the products of, who are the children of sharecroppers, tell me this is the worst it's been for them, that's profound. And so I, um, I just think that we have missed a moment, and I've had researchers to say to me, well, America doesn't care about integration anymore. America cares about choice, free will and choice. Okay, that is a, certainly a, a principle in a liberal democracy. But look where that choice is getting us because the choices are very self-interested. They're not about the collective. And so I do think that we're gonna to have to need to focus more attention. It would be great for those of us who care about these principles and values around um, how to be able to cultivate communities of difference to figure out how our work could speak to kind of at least diminishing the structural impediments in place right now. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, that's great. And certainly we do make uh, political choices about the things we choose to study, right? And we could make choices in this space. Um, I want to come back to this notion of the collective, and it's been talked about in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, Jeff, you mentioned it before as you were talking about the individual scholar versus the collective. In a few of the essays, Antar, you challenged what, what has the world's largest education association done to demonstrate that Black Lives Matter? Bill also had a challenge specifically for AERA. What are we doing? What are we not doing on so many different issues? AERA has remained silent. So I'm interested in your thoughts about what we might do. As, and there are various different collectives in which we operate in. Um, but with AERA in particular, we had one question that was emailed in advance of the session, and it was really around this notion of uh, didn't say it this explicitly, but I inferred from it, you know, it's great to have this session, but will there be any next steps, right? It's fun to have a conversation, but what else might be we doing? So, with that open. I mean, um, Bill and I were chatting about it before the session started that, um, I mean, AERA has been better you want to say, um, about being in the public space and um, years ago um, established a lobbying unit effort um, and also public statements, et cetera, et cetera. So on the one hand, there's more uh, public orientation on the part of the association. I don't think that many of us are very satisfied with how far it's gone, so that's certainly true. Um, with regard to universities, I think that's this other question, right? So, you know, in the mid-1960s, there was always the, you know, the, the big discussion around, is the, is the university politically neutral? And I, I thought we had gotten over that, but apparently we haven't. Um, I do think that it's our responsibility and obligation as scholars in a university to, you know, and we had a, a side conversation about boards of trustees, et cetera, on uh, moving our universities to be in that public space. Um, and it's a very difficult thing. I don't think universities have broken out of that tradition. Um, I don't know, I'll open it up. I just sort of, you know, just really briefly, and 
and so as a as a part of a, a failed project that I never got off the ground, but what I was going to do as I fancy myself a political scientist as well, I, I created an email address in the 2016 election, um, and I signed up for every single PAC campaign election. I signed up for every single listserv that you could, um, and because I just wanted to see kind of what types of messaging was going to go around around the election. Particularly, I, I was looking for things around education. Unfortunately, in the last election, there wasn't much, um, so that's the part why it failed. Um, but to this question of what is the role of the collective, you know, like you, you take the NRA, right? You know, that might be a, a dirty word to say in this space, but you took, the NRA doesn't pass up a chance to, to blast out an email about a, a recent incident that just happened. They don't you know, say, oh, we need to talk to our board of trustees to see if this fits with the policy about like within, within an hour of an of a incident happening that could potentially uh, infringe on Second Amendments. There's an email and a fundraising pitch to say like, this just happened, here's our stance on it, and also send us money. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, my, my thought for the collective is, you know, going to the point that was raised earlier about people will sort of believe what they sort of see the most. You know, when, when AERA and, and ASH and other, you know, organizations delay or only speak on things that have to deal with, um, you know, education research funding, but won't say things about Black Lives Matter, won't say things about state sanctioned state sanction violence or undocumented or DACA, DACA students or travel bans. And, and other groups, maybe if you were being oppositional, are speaking out on those things, then we cede the space and we create a vacuum for others to fill it. Um, and so I wonder what it would look like if, you know, every time there was an incident, there was an email in my inbox from ARA saying, here's our, here's our stance on this. And, and, but then it raises Jeff's point around the, the ideological diversity that exists within the association. So I get that there's a tension, tension there that we're not a single issue organization, we're not a single discipline organization. Uh, but I, but I do think we cede a lot of ground by remaining inactive um, on the conversation, especially when sort of our counterpart organizations are so responsive and so rapid in disseminating their stance and their points um, that it, it al always has us playing catch up. Uh, you know, speaking on behalf of the ERA, you have to be careful. We're a we're a nonprofit, so you know, as a as an association, we can't come out and say. Vote for X. And I, I appreciate that. Now, having said that, there are 25,000 members of AERA. That's one heck of a lot of members in a lot of congressional districts. And there are members in this association who know a heck of a lot about gun violence. And for us not to put out a statement that says something about gun violence and then encourages us to talk with our congressman. I'm not saying Republican, Democrat, Socialist. I'm just saying talk with your congressman. This is what the research says. It's, again, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but it's not just a missed opportunity. It's a disgrace. And that's why we're irrelevant. And there's no excuse for that. 25,000 members is a heck of a lot of people. And occasionally, absolutely, we'll come out with some statement about, we want more research funding. That's great. But talk about self-interest. I mean, come on. DACA, what have we had said about DACA? Travel bans, what have we said about travel bans? <laughs> Well, I think, I think there's a couple of issues I'd like to jump in with. I mean, one is, I, I've been looking at this a little bit just um, because I was talking about these issues in, in other forums, and it turns out, you know, AERA, I didn't know this, and I'm paying attention, AERA did come out with a statement in terms of uh, uh, opposition to congressional, uh, uh, to the administration's decision to defund certain uh, research into gun safety and things like that. And the National Academy of Education has come out with statements in terms of the, the decision in, in to, to uh, um, ask about immigration status on the census and on uh, the defunding of certain environmental science programs and things like that. So, so one issue is whether when we do it, we're doing it in an ad hoc kind of low profile way that isn't adding up 
to something. That's that, that, that you know, and that's an important issue. I don't uh, want to totally put it aside. But the other one is how do we decide which things to do, right? I mean, uh, you know, it's what it, it, AERA isn't that we would hope that it wouldn't be a top elite organization like the NRA that would just sort of decide in our name to come out on this issue or that issue. So I, I and you know, so and and I'm still wrestling with that and uh, this, you know, so let me admit that. Um but but I've you know, there's a history of the academy trying to I think for good reasons uh, position itself as above the fray in terms of politics. And I, I say for good reasons because it, it is easy to get sucked in in a way that's destructive both internally in terms of driving out some of the diversity uh, within our group but also uh, creating the impression that we are just another interest group um, which makes it easy for people to discount what we said what we say. And, and I do think that it is possible to act like an interest group without being partisan. I think we can act as an interest group on some key issues that we have special claim on. Uh, and uh, this is like a, a big collective version of Bill's point about how we can speak differently on, on college access issues than he might on, on uh, on the Dodgers or, or even other issues within uh, the ed policy realm. And, and that's constraining in some sense, because that would say, you know, don't necessarily speak out on DACA or don't necessarily speak out on Black Lives Matter unless you can anchor it to some core principles and ideas. And I wish it was easier to articulate right now what those core principles uh, are. I mean, I think we need to have some serious discussion about what are the things that, that really are important to maintaining uh, an informed use of research that recognizes that research doesn't tell us what to do in many instances. It still has to get fed into a process of judgment and the application of values. I think it does have to do with things like protecting the integrity of data I think there are, there, are, there are things about um, providing transparency in, in access to data, uh, including government uh, produced data. I think there are things about human subjects protection. I think there are things about um, a range of issues, but I, I'd love to see us have that discussion about what are the principles that we would like to have Felice Levine or whoever, the heads of other aid, uh, uh, scholarly associations be able to reference that we all know that these are the ones that we've talked about and identified and then make tactical decisions based on that rather than this kind of read your gut at a particular point in time and then uh, um, you know talk openly but maybe quietly and without a lot of effect. Add a postscript to that in a couple of ways. One is, I, I would encourage you to read the statement that AERA has on its website in terms of when we can speak, we the association. And that's your comments on, on gun, we, you know, what we have said as an association is that Congress does not allow, does not fund gun research. I wonder how that happened. And we say, oh, you should be able to fund gun research. So that's, that's, that fits within the statement we've got. What I'm referring to also, though, is that there are 25,000 members of us. I want us to be active, not passive. I, I want us to do things. I want us to, to encourage you to do things. And when we do that, I think, is, is, a, is a good question and argument to discuss, discuss. The other issue, though, brings full circle back to this, how we started this, in terms of academic freedom. So, I am a professor. If a professor is picked up off the streets in, the, in Turkey and put in prison simply because she said something, do I not say anything? If I have a colleague at my university 
who has, is a tenured full professor and cannot come back to this country because of the research he does, can we not as an association say anything about that? And I just, especially at this moment in time, I think we have to rethink a very narrow statement that we've got about when the association can speak and we never have considered when all of us can speak. It's a very passive association. We will say these things on your behalf. We don't ask you to do these things. I want us to be much more active. And disagree with one another is totally fine. We should model that. The, you know, point about disagreement, one of the things that I, I mean, I, I don't have an answer for this, you know, at, at all um, about, you know, the collective, but one of the things I thought about, like, that we would, dis I feel like we probably would disagree on a lot of things. Um, and unfortunately, one of those things would probably be anti-black violence. Um, and, I, you know, I, I wrote about it in my uh, post uh, prior to this, but I thought about uh, Dewey and how education scholars, oh, you got to read some Dewey, you know, foundational. Um, but, you know, Dewey was silent about anti-black violence and lynching, which by many regards was a crisis. And, you know, Dewey didn't say, this isn't to say that Dewey was an awful person at all, um, like definitely foundational for, for the field, but, but he, he was silent about that. And that was, I mean, I think a crisis. And at the same time period, you had someone, Ida B. Wells Barnett, who was doing research on her own, um, journalistically looking at records, and she, think about fake news, right? The common assumption was that black men were being lynched because they were raping white women. And that's what everyone, like, everyone believed, black people included, Frederick Douglass included. Um, that, you know, people would step up, like, step out against uh, lynching. Oh, no, we don't like that. But the assumption that black men were raping white women, that was kind of like, all right, we, yeah, that's, that's not cool. But that wasn't questioned. Ida B. Wells questioned that. And she did research to, like, to dispel that myth. And I, I, I say this only to say that, you know, fake news is not necessarily new. Um, and I say this also to say that, you know, as education scholars, where we are silent, you know, uh, does matter. And what, I think as AERA, we have to consider what, what counts as a crisis. Um, because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we, we have some people uh, in this organization who, after uh, a black person has, you know, perhaps been shot down by a cop, uh, their, their first question may be like, oh, what, what, what did he do? What did the person do? Right? And I may vehemently disagree with that, uh, but I'm sure we have that diversity of, of, of thought within that. So I think that's why, why this is so difficult and such a, a, you know, a beast of an issue. One point, and I was thinking of this as, as Antar speaking, I think there's at least a couple of issues. Um, um, one is what do we speak out on, and the other is how do we speak out, and, 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 and in terms of how we formulate uh, an argument. So just in the example that Antar was using, they, they, there's, there are issues in, the, in uh, like Black Lives Matter in which there are a range of claims that are open to challenge and research and we really do want to take those on. And, um, and then there's you know, what I think are very real and lots of people on the panel have talked about the fact that as, as people, we have multiple facets and things that we care deeply about and are emotional about and things like that. And, and, and so there are expressions of value and expressions of emotion. And as I said before, I think we have to do that because we're people and we have to allow that stuff. But that I don't think the association necessarily has to do or should do. Um, so um, so I, I, I would, again, I don't, deciding where you position yourself or where the association positions itself on any issue that comes up of the moment is really, really hard, you know, and I don't imagine that there's a set of guidelines that we can lay out that will pinpoint exactly what that should be. It does require debate and judgment. I do think that as, you know, that one of the core notions of research, at least as I understand it, is about the accumulation of evidence over time, multiple studies. We do have a lot to contribute, but it's not a, a, a lot of times um, of the moment. It takes time to mature for us to really understand what is the right way to address some of these issues. So, you know, so 
the pressure, which I think is real and we need to consider to speak out in the day, in the moment, um, is one of the things that I think uh, pushes us a little bit against where our real strength is in terms of what we can contribute to these debates over the long run. There's so much better. I just want to pick at it a little bit. Uh, I mean, I agree, except that I, one of the things that I find fascinating is that we already know a lot. You know, we know a lot. So when X issue comes up, we can act in the moment because we know a lot. There's a lot of research, right? So, and I think we sometimes are mobilized by and maybe it's part of research DNA, I don't know, or as our DNA as research is that, you know, we have to investigate that particular thing in that moment, yes, and then it, you know, it'll take forever to get through IRB and da 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 and whatnot, but we already know a lot, you know. Um, I would bet you in this room, there's a lot of knowledge on how to make K-12 schools better and more effective for all types of learning. Here are some paradoxes, some contradictions, some tensions that I've been struggling with, and I, Antar, I appreciate what you've just said. Um, I, two things that come to my mind. Um, one is, isn't it ironic that part of the reason that we're passive and silent is because we want to maintain our legitimacy as an academic organization, but we're making ourselves more irrelevant? So that's irony. Um, or paradox, I sometimes get them mixed. But, the second thing is, I think when there are big issues about which we can already marshal evidence, as a, if we want to be a research practice policy organization, right, there are things that we can make statements about that says, here's what we have as the evidence, and we can make those statements about those, right? That's just there. That's our, I think that's our duty as a research-based organization. So things around what we know about guns and violence, what we know about trauma, in its relationship in education, the trauma from various kinds of stressors. What we know about the General Accounting Office has just shown us unequivocally what we know about disproportionality and discipline and how that's raced and gendered. We have research that the AERA, and then of course there can be dissenting opinions or you can bring in how, the, how things actually challenge each other, but we can synthesize that quickly. But here is a dilemma that I think, and this goes back to something you said, Antar, that is so frustrating to me. There is a huge study, big data is in, right? Big data is in, a large study put out by the most talented economist, Raj Chetty, that was on the cover of the New York Times, and you all saw it. If you did, you should go and see it, because also the visualizations are fascinating. About the fact that we now know that even if you're a black male born into the upper tails of the income um, uh, distribution, with everything else, you know, the good schools, the good neighborhoods, the family structure, all the conventional, traditional explanations, your chances of staying there are, at, are equally as likely as your, your chances of falling to the bottom. And what does that implicate? It implicates racism in a society against the black male body. And do you know what researchers are saying? Because we have to be so careful, and this goes back historically. Well, we don't really have the measurements, the precise measurements of racism to really attribute it to that. Okay, that's careful, I understand that. But we're all living, breathing, and doing racism daily. We have enough ethnographic, interpretive, observational, research to marshal to show that these things are happening on the ground. And so I think my frustration is how we then parse out the debate in terms of the methodological differences. Because the big data that can show certain patterns unequivocally is not good. The researchers, even Chetty himself is careful not to say it's racism. Because I don't have the measure across all the, the, the census uh, 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 zones in the country. And it's also so variable and it's so context specific, how it manifests itself. So I think for some of us, particularly those of us who are marginalized backgrounds, who know these things are real, and each of us should know they're real. We're seeing it. Two men went into a Starbucks in Philadelphia just this past weekend and couldn't even sit down. 
you know. Um, and, 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 and it was racialized because a white woman prior to them walked in and didn't buy anything and she was allowed to use the bathroom. And we will say we see these as anecdotes. But there is enough research. I think the dilemma, the moral dilemma for me, um, the political dilemma that's embedded in research is that there are certain intangible and tangible processes that we will say it's hard to measure and then we'll disavow those. It, 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 it we won't, won't name speak. Them. We won't speak. So I'm just putting on record, I'm going to say it. I'm going to speak it, and people can question my authenticity as a researcher, but I think this is where we have to step out to show, yeah, there are some complexities, and maybe the science hasn't evolved enough yet for us to be able to capture all that complexity, but people's lives are at stake. And so you ask the question, I think we can marshal evidence, and then I think we have to be real about what we can't measure certain ways, but we have enough other kinds of research and practices to help support it. So, yeah. Gets me, and is again with with this association, we have a very rigid. We can't speak because we don't know. But the American Medical Association tells us all, "Don't eat eggs." <laughs> and you know, the egg industry goes and they go. Actually, you can eat <laughs> eggs, just don't eat fried eggs. And then, like, no what? frying pans are bought. And then, then it's, you can actually eat fried eggs, but don't cook them in butter. Olive oil is the, and but we don't do that. We don't know because we're afraid. I, I shared a thing on what works clearinghouse, and we couldn't say anything. If, don't eat eggs. I mean, why? Do, why are we like that? Because we think we're second-class citizens because we're in education. This notion of speaking out plays out across uh, fields, right? Um, you would think that we would be more willing to speak out because we've chosen education as an applied area. You know, we're interested in our hearts. We want to make a difference on really important social social issues. I've had a leadership role with the faculty senate, and uh, it's been quite interesting to try to raise and encourage action. You know, uh, we did pass a statement against the executive orders on immigration, and we had a terrible racist incident on campus, and we were able to act in there, but. It was exhausting to try to continually engage in these conversations to try to persuade people across disciplines about what, where's our academic freedom, what can we speak out on. I think it's worth pushing on. You know, I think we have to be in the spaces that we're in. We have to be continuing to think, who are we representing, what's our role and responsibility, and how can we at least push at the margins on these issues. I have more questions, but we have a we have some time left, and I know that there are people here. We have some microphones. This is being um, live streamed, so I, uh, it would be helpful if you would come to a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, so. Wonderful conversation. Just uh, to operationalize something that you were just mentioning right now, I just wanted to ask if we could entertain not just looking at what individuals can do, or what the ARA as a collective body could do. But there is this middle level intervention that we could take advantage of, and other organizations do that. There's many special interest groups here, and instead of having this issue of which issues do we deal with, each of the special interest groups could really just say, that's my issue, and everybody's at a university, organize, okay, next week we're having a webinar on this, it's an open debate like you are having right here, discuss this, bring up the research, and then have that recorded so that we can actually use this within ARA to say, these are some of the, this is the evidence that's being, um, that we're generating as educators on these big issues. So I just throw that out there as another way to do this. It's not just, you know, the voice of the group or individuals, because the power really is in the group, but if you can find that middle level, it might be more uh, effective. An organization of volunteer members, and so there's opportunity for everybody in this room to provide that type of leadership. I think that's a great idea. I'm going to break the rule and not ask a question, <laughs> but I'm Julianne Barron. I'm the Director of Government Relations for AERA, so I've been listening very carefully to your panel. Um, just for the sake of accuracy, we did release a, gun, uh, a statement on gun violence. That should have gone to all the members. In fact, our executive director was quoted in an NPR study, so there was some attention 
um, because the statement was released widely, as well as on the travel ban and, and numerous other ones. Um, also, we have increasingly been developing opportunities for people to participate, whether it's delegation visits or briefings on the Hill, and so we have really, I think, been increasing our presence. Um, I guess I'll just say we do have an advocacy toolkit on the site, um, and there are every month in highlights updates and opportunities, and so I just sort of, I'm, you can email me, my name, my email is jbaron, uh, j-b-a-r-o-n at aera.net. Um, we have a real trouble getting people to be involved, and so we send out the action alerts, and we get as many unsubscribing as acting, and so if anybody who wants to participate more, I would love that help or any insights on how we can engage, so... And just a small plug for the ARA Day of Advocacy. I had the opportunity to participate a few weeks ago, and um, it was quite interesting and helpful. You know, I'm somebody who thinks about the role of policy in creating change, and to have the opportunity to talk with staffers and hear the questions that they ask and really what they are trying to look for and the ways you can steer that, help perhaps to steer that conversation, it's very worthwhile. So. All of what... What you just said, I would encourage all of us to contact both the speaker as well as Felice because they are willing to listen. And then the question is, when Mrs. DeVos, DeVos was on 60 Minutes, did you go say, God, I wonder what AERA has to say to what she said, and went immediately to the AERA website to see what the response was? And if you didn't, why not? And what can we do so that you would? This, this again, I get gets into the ideological fray. So I, so I appreciate the clarification. Um, but I, I think it's different to release a statement that says, in in this sort of self interest, self interested protection of we need more research or we support research on this versus like black and brown bodies are being murdered by the state. We disavow this unequivocally period not tied to research not tied to anything like as a as a as a um educational institution you know it, that is seeing these things happen in society we don't stand for this now I, I get that it has to relate back to education or or it has to relate back to, to funding but I, I think there's a difference as a as an education scholar where we're not where we're not parsing that out and i don't know if ar is the space for that but that's what i'm talking about with statements around that a point that I didn't make clear enough early on, so it's my fault, but I do think it's our obligation to, to say what it means, you know, to say that, and I had a graduate student who had done this really great work, we were doing social media, trauma, racialized aggression, blah, 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 and he wanted to say blah, 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 that it was racism. And he asked me, can I say it's racism? I was like, does your evidence support it? Right? Then say it. And what it, that's the what does it mean, right? And I think we're afraid to say that. Hi, thank you uh, for this very interesting and important conversation. Uh, my name is Hyman Bass. I'm at the University of Michigan. And I have three comments, if you'll allow. One is that um, academic freedom and freedom of speech, uh, more broadly, are inherently paradoxical. We're not allowed to exercise the freedom that suppresses the freedom of others. Uh, and that they put other people in danger. For example, we're not allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater. So uh, the question is, can we outlaw hate speech? Hate speech that either encourages or perhaps uh, uh, legitimizes, gets license to behaviors of others that put people in danger and threaten their welfare. Uh, I think we can. There are vibrant democracies in which such hate speech is outlawed. And I think that drawing that line is an important agenda that we should pursue. Secondly, I think that, and this has been touched on in several of your comments, we live in a kind of anti-knowledge regime. Uh, and I'm surprised at how much the academic world has sat by passively to see this. The suppression of research on climate change, similarly on gun violence. And frankly, I think that this is an issue that's not specific to the academic world. I think it's something that would make sense 
in the public domain? If someone in your family became chronically ill, think of the idea that you would suppress research on looking for a cure or a diagnosis. That makes sense to people. They don't have to be expert, knowledge experts, to recognize the importance of that. And the fact that we have national policies that permit us to understand things, phenomena that are threatening us, I think uh, uh, something that has to change. And I think mu much of what you've been saying addresses that. Finally, uh, fake news is something that really threatens us and we don't know yet quite how to cope with it. It requires a kind of digital literacy that we don't, haven't been prepared for. And I would call your attention to a, a project at Stanford by historians with Sam Weinberg, which has noted, so historians by, by trading are equipped to detect the authenticity of sources. But when they tested people on examples of fake news with standard undergraduates and historians, they failed completely. And the people who were 100% on target were the fact checkers. And they used entirely different methods, entirely different approaches, and they have produced uh, uh, a set of practices that forbid people to intervene on that. Finally, I would just like to quote a website, I don't know what uh, saying that, I don't know exactly its origins, but it said, if you wondered how a culture society like Germany could watch and allow the rise of fascism, now you know. First point, I would never uh, speak for Felice Levine, the executive director, or Amy Stewart Wells, the incoming president. But the idea of, of the association writing an informed piece about hate speech, and right now just saying it as broadly as that, would be a good use of the association's time. And I think Felice and Amy would welcome that. But I don't know what their agenda is, but it's important. That's all. <clears throat> Name is Jamal Abdulalim, uh, education editor at The Conversation, which is a um, web platform for scholars to share their knowledge and expertise. Professor Perner, it's good to see you. Uh, all these years of working together. I deeply appreciate the help you've rendered, um, even back in my days as a journalist. Uh, my question is this, is that to what extent do scholars have an obligation to reach out uh, and or respond uh, to the press? Um, because a lot of times the criticism is that this or that view is not getting out, but then as one who's worked in the field uh, as a journalist and now as an editor, I found that sometimes the response is, I don't have time. Um, I'm working on this or that, or, or the sense of urgency is just not there. And maybe the response might come a week or two later and in a 24 hour news cycle, that just does not work. So I'm wondering if you can speak to what kind, type of obligation you believe scholars have, again, to reach out and or respond to the press in order to get um, not just views out, but the research and set the record straight on what the research shows on various topics, particularly in the realm of education. Thank you. I do have to say that um, I hear what you say, and I do think that that's true. Um, I have colleagues who will say, well, I'm too busy for that, et cetera. So I do, you know, it's very, very true. Um, the flip side, too, is, and in fact, my sister started as a journalist, the same sister who's been a political strategist, which is, I find interesting. Um, as I reminded her, I said, yes, but, you know, don't email me and say that you need it in two hours, because that's kind of, that's going to be tough. But I do think it's our obligation, and um, I don't know how best to educate ourselves. I mean, I'm an associate dean now, and I talk to my faculty about that, you know, and, and how it is that how can we help them in that response? You know, because sometimes it requires a little bit, sort of, the structures that can help them. Um, but I think it's our obligation. I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, 
Yes. That's cor yes, that's correct. Exactly. No, um, that's a very good point in the sense that, you know, how is it that the structures of uh, promotion, merit, um, the professionalization of the field um, has that as a value, right? It's more difficult in some institutions than others, um, granted, but you're right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so two things. I get calls from the media quite often, and a lot of times the things I don't know anything about. And so I do try to um, delegate those uh, or direct those uh, journalists to the persons who have the expertise. I do think it's, it's really important um, to think about media training for our faculty. But many people don't um, know how to to parse it out because uh, sometimes it's too academies or jargony or how to actually explain it because jur journalists are trying to uh, reach a, a, a wider audience. Um, so that's one thing. So I think it's important about media training. I think I, I mentioned the op-ed project, which I went through several times, which I, I thought was really good. Um, but I think there's another thing from my own personal experience or interacting with the media that um, is a bit frustrating for me and I've heard other scholars say. Life, the society is complex, and life is complex, and the research that we do, oftentimes we have to add caveats or nuances, or it comes out in our work, and when you try to convey that, it gets lost in the quoting. And so when I read things that have been excerpted from my interviews, it feels so out of context sometimes, um, because I think a lot of journalists are looking for the quick sound bites, and so I think it's a two-way thing. I wouldn't just say that... And so it makes me now a little more hesitant about what I'm saying, or I have to think more carefully about what comes out of my mouth, and then if it's going to really deeply convey what you need. Um, and so, I, so part of that may be my, my, the need for me to have more media training, but I also think, and I appreciate the Spencer Foundation and the Knight Foundation and others who are training journalists to be able to be more savvy with how to, to, to also depict research. Because I think we need more of that. So it's training on both sides. I'll just put this Senator at USC, and, and the current president will often email the four past presidents for an issue. And I got one in, in a, on a January with one of those exclamation points. And it said, that, this is January, and the president needs an emergency meeting of the past presidents. Please, please fill in the doodle, doodle scholar thing. The meetings were for April, and that's academic life. I, to I, I totally agree with you, and I, I get what Prudence is saying, too, and I'm very careful in terms of what I say, but if we're, I, and I know you guys are on deadline, so if you call me and, and I can respond within two hours, I will, and I, and I think that we're getting microscopically better at it. But that's the, that's the problem. The culture is that the emergency is, is four months down the road when, oof, well, you know, I'll change my schedule for that. Really quickly, I'm, and there's, there's also a difference between an outlet like the conversation where you get to formulate an op-ed or an essay or an argument versus responding to a journalist calling on a particular call. And I talked to a fair amount of journal. I never did earlier in my career, and quite... Frankly, I'm glad now that I didn't earlier in my career because I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but that was just me. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, again, some people like this. Some people are better at that. I, I, I think that's great. But there is a difference also in terms of journalists in terms of how they approach these issues, you know. And some I'll be on the phone with for 35 minutes, 45 minutes. It'll end up maybe being a quote, but I feel like the article was informed by our discussion. And then that person calls again, I'll, I'll call them back. And there's others where you're on there for 35, 40 minutes, and the very last thing you said is the thing that shows up there, and, it, and the article itself seems like um, the interview was all aimed at getting that quote. And that person I'd be less likely to call back. Good morning. Thank you so much for this conversation. I'm fairly new to AERA, and this is my first conference, so I've appreciated this dialogue. I have um, two kind of comments and a question for you guys. Um, 
going back to academic freedom, how well do you think we actually train uh, graduate students to exercise that academic freedom? And to what extent does that potential lack of training around that topic threaten academic freedom, as well as the influx um, and the use of adjunct faculty and threatening that academic freedom? And then a different kind of suggestion for maybe a potential next step is if there's limitations around what AER, AERA can say, what about, and, and I'm sorry if this already exists, um, I'm new to, the, or new to the association, but guiding principles on how to respond to other researchers when our views differ that might um, strengthen that discourse and increase inclusivity and model how people should respond to research. Okay, we'll just take the next question too. We're almost out of time and then we can just have some fun. Okay, um, thank you very much for a very um, stimulating conversation. Um, I just want to uh, share um, two points. Um, and one is that I do use um, op-ed as one of the options for the midterm uh, paper um, for my students, and um, I need to um, give them more training of how to write good ones, but um, I think that's something that everybody can do in our classroom. Um, the other one is just a statement, um, because um, I have to digress a little bit, because um, um, some of you talked about uh, deep-rooted uh, racism, and um, I have to say that I'm very privileged um, professor in Canada, previously in the United States, and um, our children are also uh, positioned as my, uh, model minority, and uh, they are sometimes viewed that um, as having no problems in schools, but um, many of them do. And when they become uh, professors, grow up and become professors, um, they become really marginalized. And um, I would like to see more um, sisters like me um, at ARA. Um, I haven't seen um, much representation of my sisters. And um, when my sisters become professors, um, we are often mistaken for graduate students or mistaken for another Asian faculty member. And um, that really hurt us. And I have been in conversation with my roommate, an associate professor from China. So I would like to encourage ARA to um, really um, shed light on um, different types of um, minoritized faculty members and students. Thank you. Any final comments? Uh, yeah question about uh, graduate students and academic freedom, because I think about this a lot, because so I'm only in my second year um, on, uh, as being a faculty member, so my graduate experience is still very salient to me. Um, and I had the fortunate experience of um, you know, learning with and, um, and from um, all tenured faculty members. And so the ways in which I got to see them practice their academic freedom and speak on things and put out visualizations and reports and be engaged in the public space for sure shaped how I think about myself now without tenure. Um, and, but now on the flip side, when I think about my graduate students and the things that I say and the things that I write and the things that I encourage them without that protection, I, I, I think about that a lot of how they're not getting the same socialization just vicariously by seeing me do those things that um, they might get from working more directly with a, a, a scholar that has, has tenure. So I think I appreciate the question because it's something that I think about a lot of how can I demonstrate and use my academic freedom even as an untenured faculty member to, to set a good example for the graduate students that I, that I work with, to push conversation, to be involved um, in, in the spaces and communities that I care about, but then also to provide and stop and reflect about that process. And so, um, you know, I would love feedback and suggestions, you know, after about how to continue to do that. Um, but, I, but I think I got that fortunately because I worked with faculty that had tenure and were doing active public work in a lot of different ways. And so how do I recreate that now when I don't have those same things yet um, is, is definitely a question. Academic freedom, and I think that's important. But I learn by doing 
And I've, I've been very lucky in my academic career I, because I think academe is a lot of shushing, right? Shh. You don't, you don't know anything, so don't say anything. And then you're a tenured associate, but you're not a full, or you're not an endowed chair. And I mean, all my academic life, I've been very lucky and very supported by people who have told me not to shush. And one quick example, I, the LA Times called me in, uh, many years ago and asked me about a sporting problem that we had on campus at that time. And I responded and he said, should I speak to anybody else? And I said, the Vice President for Student Affairs. I called the Vice President and I said, this guy may be calling you about this current scandal. And he went, did you go through the office of propaganda the, in the president's office? And I said, no, no, I just told him to call you. And he went, oh my God, you know, that's some, you can't do that. You were going to be in big trouble. How could you have done that? So then I got nervous and I called the provost and I said, I may have messed up. You know, I talked to the guy in the LA Times and, and I told him to talk to Michael. And Michael said, we shouldn't have done that. And he laughed. And he said, you have tenure. You can say whatever you want. I was very proud to be an academic that day. And that's what we have to have rather than shh, shh. You don't know anything you're a graduate student. We um, Bill taught a class, uh, the role of the engaged intellectual in uh, the 21st century. And we actually had to write a paper about academic freedom. So we, we had to think about that very early. Um, but one of the things he would often say, um, and I remember this it was five years ago, he would often say, like, you, you can't, you have to start now. You can't wait until you get tenure. You have to start doing these things now. Because then there's always going to be another milestone where you're like, oh, I have to wait till this, I have to wait till that. And I, yeah, like, likewise, I've been very fortunate to have Bill as my mentor, and he's likewise empowered me to, to use my voice. Um, so I think, yeah, this socialization and mentorship is very important for that. I want to take up the question of uh, the, the professor from Canada, and I thank you for that question. Um, I wish we had more time to really delve into your question because every time the question of Asian Americans or Asians or uh, large Asian Canadians um, raises that, and we talk about the paradoxes, nobody takes it on. And I wholly acknowledge, I was in a two-hour conversation with a sister Asian American sociologist yesterday about this very question. I raised it at a big lecture about three weeks ago. Even with that study I mentioned, there is a paradox there. In the United States context, Asian Americans look so well on many of the outcomes, educational outcomes, and mobility outcomes, that people are not taking up the question, I, I, I would hypothesize, because we're being attended to what we see as the big problems and the ones that have bigger scale which are generally now tie, uh, which are associated with those of uh, African American, Latinx, and Native American students. And so what you're seeing is also then those people who focus on those populations on these panels. And I absolutely agree that we can't, you know, we have to be attendant to the full um, uh, spectrum. I, the one thing, while I love the presentation on, uh, at the presidential address and right with the spoken word, the one thing that was glaring to me when they asked the question, who's the public in public education? I did not see Asian voices and I didn't see white voices. And I think we can't go too far the other way. And, um, and so we, we are creating this kind of, you know, the research Mia Tuan and others have done on honorary whiteness among Asian Americans or the model minority. And then what we do is then we render those communities invisible. So I thank you for raising that. That's where, again, our myopia. And, um, and we cannot ignore it. And I think this is what our, us, us, the presidents of the AERA, I hope they will be mindful. I want to be mindful, and I certainly um, thank you for pointing it out. And I'm sorry. Sorry. Great. So this has been a terrific conversation. There are clearly many more issues to address and talk about. And I hope that we all continue forward to try to figure out how to make a difference on these really important issues. I want to thank the panelists. Thanks for sharing your views today. And thank you all for coming and participating in this session. Thank you.